I'm going to be courageous and see whether this part of it works. If it doesn't, no problem. Uh, share screen. Uh, okay, I'd like to do that. Ah, and here we go. Let's see. So when we think about the Messiah at this time of mm -hmm. year, this is what might come to mind. And let me know if you cannot hear it. Can you I hear cannot it? Hear, no. Cannot? Okay. That's mm -hmm. what I was that's what I was thinking that that would not work. Okay, let's go right to the PowerPoint. Keep that <laughs> lovely idea of music in your mind. And I'm going to go right to the PowerPoint now because that's my safer one. Okay, so let's share that. Oh, I guess I should introduce myself. Um, my name is Carol Harris Shapiro. I am a rabbi and also have a doctorate in religious studies. Uh, my area of interest has always been these kinds of intersections and borrowings between religions. Uh, and of course, when you talk about the Messiah, that is a shared, uh, that's a shared idea. And between Judaism and Christianity in very different ways. And so I thought that um, this would be a fun topic to help folks understand, A, where in the heck does this word come from? What does it mean? What does it mean to Jews? How it morphed and changed, what it means to Christians a little bit. I can't get into everything. And just give you some bare outlines and then move to the rabbinic ideas of the Messiah, a whole panoply of messianic contenders within Judaism, some of which you may not have heard of. And the last uh, piece we're going to look at is uh, the Lubavitch uh, uh, Rebbe Schneerson and his claims to be a messiah and what has happened with them and what is continuing. So uh, let me go ahead. What you have here, by the way, is a, a picture of a uh, rose in Israel. And one of the um, uh, images for the Messiah is, is this idea of a rose blossoming. Uh, and we see a lot of this kind of coded language in the poems, the PU team, that we recite, especially on Yom Kippur. So I thought that was in, since we don't know what the Messiah looks like, a lovely flower. Okay. So what I was trying to do, and yet the music did not come, and someday I will learn how to do this properly, um, is uh, Handel's Messiah, which I still think is a gorgeous piece of writing. And uh, it is a paraphrase of Isaiah, the, the prophet Isaiah in the Hebrew Bible, chapter nine, verse five. Now, this is how Christians translate it. For unto us a child is born. Actually, this is Handel. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon, I, I will not torture you, shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Interesting, because if you're calling somebody this son, you're calling him a mighty God. Well, that kind of says, hey, well, didn't Isaiah predict this idea of a uh, of Jesus fully divine and fully human? Eh, not so simple because it depends on where the comma is. I know some of you uh, have the uh, have read like eats, shoots and leaves right? Commas are important. The funny thing is there are no commas in Hebrew. So the uh, Hebrew, the Jewish translation of this, it just, and perhaps even more understandable, for a child has been born to us, a son has been given us, and authority has settled on his shoulders. He has been named the mighty God is planning grace, the eternal father, i.e. the mighty God, a peaceable ruler. Um, yeah, very different. And in one translation, you're talking about this child as God. In the other translation, which I don't know, I'm a rabbi, I think it's a much better translation anyway. 
uh, is that you would you would say the mighty God is planning grace as part of a name. In Judaism, many of the names uh, that we have in the Bible have the word El in them. And El is that divine signifier, but we're not calling everybody Nathaniel. We're not saying that anybody, any Nate is God. Um, it is just part of that biblical name. And it honors God, but it's not saying the person is God. So we have this beautiful, beautiful oratorio that uh, brings in this verse. And this is, of course, one of the verses that Christians understand to uh, predict and to verify that Jesus was the Messiah, Son of God, and God himself. Okay, I'll keep going. Not Judaism. Now, uh, in Maimonides' 13 Principles of Faith, uh, for those of us who are synagogue goers, there is a poem that takes the 13 Principles of Faith and sometimes is recited, sung at the end of the service instead of Adon Olam, and that poem is called Yigdal. Yigdal is a kind of a paraphrase of Maimonides' 13 Principles of Faith. Maimonides, Moses Ben Maimon, was a giant uh, in uh, Jewish philosophy, in Jewish learning. He was also a physician, uh, and he lived a little over a thousand years ago. Uh, he lived in Spain and then in Egypt, and he was a systematizer. We're going to talk about him again, but in Judaism, this is what we say. I believe in, with perfect faith in the coming of the Messiah, and even though he may delay, I will await him every day. And I did want, I did not want to trigger people, but as I was looking at, for YouTube for clips, which of course failed me in terms of the sound, um, you'll find some really nice ones. Um, but there's one where uh, troops uh, in the IDF are singing this. And I found that especially in these times, a very poignant, right? Uh, messianic hope is really something that comes to the fore. Times seem pretty desperate. Um, and we will be seeing, like I said, some Jewish versions of this, as well as touching on uh, Jesus of Nazareth. But it's really interesting that other religions, other cultures also have messiahs. There's something called the Mahdi in Islam, Maitreya Buddha in Buddhism, uh, in other religions as well, there and obviously Jesus and obviously our Messiah, there is this notion of somehow somebody needs to rescue us from the pit of despair that we have dug for ourselves as human beings. And so that messianic hope does tend to wax stronger when times are tough. Okay, so what is this word? What is this word? So. We have this word Mashiach, which is the Hebrew for Messiah. Messiah is like the Greekified way of pronouncing this word. I guess they didn't like to clear their throats. Not too much going on. And it literally means this every Hebrew word is a three letter root, sometimes a two letter root. Um, but mostly three letter roots. And uh, if you look at the letters themselves, it means to sneer or to anoint. And you're like, oh my gosh, what does that have to do with the Messiah? Is he a massage therapist? Um, and in fact, uh, in the ancient Near East, we're gonna see in the next slide, a list of things that get anointed with oil. That's the idea of anointing. Um, and it was a common thing for kings to actually get oil poured on them or smeared on them when they were taking their, excuse me, taking their place as king. So uh, in parallel and earlier East, Near Eastern cultures, such as Ugarit, which 1300 BCE, somewhere in that range, we find anointing with oil a common way to denote a new elevated status or to purify. So this is um, a common thing, okay? In the region in which they were, if you wanted to denote, here you are, you're the king, 
this is your inauguration, it was anointing with oil, perhaps rather than a crown, uh, as we would think of it in the Western world, that would make someone a, officially a king. Why oil? Well, oil was an important commodity. It was valuable. Uh, and that always helps, right? If you want to denote a kingly status. Um, from one uh, non-Jewish ancient source, the idea is, is as the oil soaks into the skin, so too do you soak in a new being, a new uh, or transformed self. And considering how dry the air is and has been in the Middle East, I think that works quite well. Okay. Now, who and what were anointed in the Hebrew Bible? Who had the oil treatment? Interestingly enough, sacred objects as the um, uh, tabernacle was being built, some of the objects were anointed with oil. Uh, when uh, Jacob has his dream and he erects a stone, uh, when he's fleeing from Esau and he dreams of a ladder and angels going up and down, uh, he anoints a pillar of stone that he puts up and he says, God was in this place and I did not know. And uh, he, he wants to mark that as a place where earth and heaven are very, they have a very thin veneer. They can actually interchange. Priests, priests were anointed uh, Aaron, his sons, before they took their priestly office in serving God in a ritual way. Prophets were anointed. Uh, Elijah, one of the prophets, of course, that maybe is more well known. He's the one who we set the place for during Passover. Uh, he did that with his successor, Elisha. He anointed him and said, you're basically my successor prophet. But for our purposes, the most important thing is that kings were anointed, okay? Saul was anointed by Samuel, Saul, the first king of Israel. David was anointed. And uh, Solomon was anointed. And interestingly enough, this is not limited to Jewish kings. Cyrus of Persia, who was honored as a good king because he let the Jews come back from exile and return back to the land. But he was called the Mashiach, the anointed one. So this is simply a, a language that says to be anointed might mean that you're a priest. If you're an anointed one, a Mashiach or king. Okay. Now, in our daily Amidah prayer, we also reference the Mashiach, but we do it in kind of a roundabout way. And I am not, the scholarship is not completely sure why we don't use the language of Mashiach. Some say that this blessing was created in order to um, weed out Jewish Christians from the congregation. We're not really sure, um, but it is interesting that the word isn't used. And if it was done relatively late, then perhaps Christianity was seen as a potential threat and they wanted to avoid the use of Mashiach or the word Mashiach was being used so much for Jesus that they didn't want to confuse the worshiper. In any case, this is in our daily Amidah. It is one of our blessings, blessing 15. Uh, and at Semach David Avdecha Mehera Tatsmiach the Karnot Harum Bishua Techa Kilishuatcha Ki Vinu Kol Hayom, and then the blessing Matsmiach Karen Yeshua, and speedily calls it should be like the sprout of David. It sounds like he's a Brussels sprout. Um, it's an old translation. Uh, it's it's really the offspring of David, your servant, to flourish and exalt his power with your deliverance. We hope all day for your deliverance. Blessed are you, Adonai, who causes the power of salvation to sprout. Notice that um, the offspring is not God here. It's very clear, right? That uh, God enables the offspring of David to be able to come and to bring about 
a better world, salvation. Okay, so this kind of begs the question. David was long, long ago. Solomon was long, long ago. The destruction of the Davidic line, you would think, was long, long ago. Why are we praying for a descendant of David at all? Ah, because biblically there was a promise. And uh, Jews are holding God to that promise and to some extent Christians uh, when they read what they call the Old Testament. In 2 Samuel 7, 16, David has done what he could. He brings the Ark of the Covenant as new king, he brings the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. His son Solomon will be the one to build the first temple. This is more of a makeshift kind of a uh, structure. David settled in Jerusalem in his new capital. And Nathan says to David, your house and your kingship shall ever be secure before you. Your throne shall be established forever. There is a scholarly argument whether le'olam means for a really long time or forever, uh, but certainly at least later Judaism understood the word to be forever. And it's a common understanding of the word um, as it's used a lot within rabbinic Judaism. So although there is an interruption in the Davidic line, uh, the last Davidic descendant died um, and we don't know where the line is now. Uh, the idea is that it will be someday be restored along with Davidic kingship. And once again, we're sort of left with, but what, do we really want a king? Um, and that's an interesting question in and of itself. But this is the symbolism. This is the idea idea of the Mashiach. So we're looking for an a descendant of David to take his, and I'm saying his because this is, you know, it's based on biblical norms, um, to take his rightful place as king of Israel. And um, he is then will be a Mashiach. He's going to be the anointed one. Okay. Now, end time prophecies, okay, are, they're filled. They're absolutely um, filled in the uh throughout the prophets. Not all of them involve a Mashiach. However, two of them do. And what I think I would like to do here is to bring up, let's bring up here, and I'm just going to look at Isaiah, something I did not do. I wasn't sure about my time. 11 2. Uh, okay. Uh, 11 2 through 5. Uh, not on KGV. I do want, however, uh, let's do uh, Safari. Oh, there we are. And this will give you one example. Okay. Okay, I hope folks can see this. Let me go back and go You're back. You're not sharing screen yet. I will do that. I will do that. I'm going to get there. Okay, where is Lordy? It's really bad when you can't. There we go. All right, let me share screen. Ah. Okay, and get my language. Here we go. Okay. This doesn't involve sound. So I'm hoping that'll work. There we are. Okay. So this is again, another uh, text that Christians use as a proof text for Jesus. But um, if we look at it, uh, it is, it can be read a lot of different ways or understood. But here is Isaiah hoping, and this is what's called first Isaiah. It's during uh, the, uh, the the conquering of uh, Judea by the Babylonians. Um, it's a very bad time, lots of wars. And Isaiah prophesies this, but a shoot shall grow out of the stump of Jesse, Jesse being David's father. A twig shall sprout from his stock. 
the spirit of God shall alight upon him. Again, not saying he's God, a spirit of wisdom and insight, a spirit of counsel and valor, a spirit of devotion and reverence for God. Now that's important. He shall sense the truth by his reverence for God. He shall not judge by what his eyes behold, nor decide by what his ears perceive. Thus he shall judge the poor with equity and decide with justice for the lowly of the land. He shall strike down a land with the rod of his mouth. Some of these translations are a little tougher than others. And slay the wicked with the breath of his lips. Justice shall be the girdle of his loins and faithfulness the girdle of his waist. And here's something we might remember, these kinds of images. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard lie down with the kid, the calf, the beast of prey, and the fatling together with a little boy to herd them. The cow and bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion, like the ox, shall eat straw. A babe shall play over a viper's hole and an infant pass its hand over an adder's den. In all of my sacred mount, nothing evil or vile shall be done for the land shall be filled with devotion to God as water covers the sea. In that day, the stock of Jesse that has remained standing shall become a standard to peoples. Nation shall seek his counsel and his abode shall be honored. So that's kind of interesting. It's clearly a human, but a human that is filled with the spirit of God and has maybe some special powers associated with it. Uh, that should be right. Let's see. Oh, I don't know why that does that. Um, let me go back to slide. Show. Oh, sorry, guys. If I was good at this, I would have a very different job. Okay, I want to go here and I want to go from beginning. Here we are. Okay. So, like I said, some of the end time prophecies involve a figure such as this. Jeremiah and Isaiah both bring it in. Some of them don't. But that expectation was clearly there about four to five hundred years after the time that King David was supposed to have lived. So you can see this is a really enduring belief. Okay, what do we glean just from the Hebrew Bible itself about the future Mashiach? Okay, future king of Israel, fully human, pious, is going to defeat Israel's enemies, okay? There'll be an ingathering of all the Jewish exiles back to the land of Israel. Israel will be the leading nation of the world, and there might be a transformation of the creation itself. So it depends on whether you want to look at Isaiah's words and some of the other places, you know, lion and lamb. If you want to look at that literally, there will be a real change in human beings. I mean, Jeremiah says we're going to get our hearts of stone removed and it's going to be replaced with hearts of flesh, which means we'll actually be obedient, and not stubborn. Um, so is there going to be a huge transformation in the world? Some of the prophets say yes. Some say, who read this prophetic material, say it was all meant as metaphors for a peaceable and prosperous kingdom. But wait, there's more. Okay, so how do we get from that figure to Jesus, the son of God, died for our sins, rose on the third day? Um, this is really a discussion about Jewish messiahs, but we have to understand, was it such a huge leap? How did we go from Isaiah saying what he said to about 500 years later, and suddenly the messiah is divine, and the messiah is going to you know, forgive our sins, and he's going to be nailed to a cross? How the hecky heck did this happen? Well, we have this interesting thing called intertestamental or extra biblical literature. So the closing of the Hebrew canon, more or less, there's a couple of books like the book of Daniel that are later, possibly Proverbs is a little later, Ruth is a little later, but a lot of it was closed and set into, you know, as our canon very early on, let's say around 300. BCE, right? 300 before the Common Era. 
The New Testament, the first books are Paul's letters, and that's around 50 C or what some people call AD. Okay. That's a big time frame. It's huge. It's huge. So what happens in between? Where's all the writing? Well, this is where the extra biblical literature comes in. Some of it has been preserved by the Catholic Church who included in their Bible, but there's lots and lots and lots out there that weren't included in anyone's Bible. These were everything from folk tales to um, new, new proverbs, new psalms, uh, different prophetic books, uh, and all kinds of interesting uh, texts. Some of these we have existing in monasteries in Greek. We have them in Coptic. The Ethiopian Christians were some of the very earliest Christians and Coptic is their language. Um, I'm sorry, Egypt is their language. Um, but also the Ethiopians have that as well. So some of the very earliest Christians, Syriac Christians. So we find some of these writings there, okay? And some of them, like I said, were preserved in the Catholic Church canon. Protestant Christians and Jews do not include them. Uh, interestingly, since we're coming up on Hanukkah and happy Hanukkah uh, tomorrow and for the rest of the week, um, the Book of the Maccabees, there's four Maccabees books Two of them are in the Catholic canon, all four are for Jews, extra biblical literature, and for Protestants. But boy, is that interesting reading. A lot of our stories about Hanukkah come from the book of First Maccabees, for example. Um, and yet that's not in our Bible. So I, to be very careful, we could say that much of this literature was produced between 200 BCE and 100 CE. And what happens to the concept of the Messiah is really interesting. Part of this does have to do with not just Hellenic or Greek influence on Jewish thought and ideas, but also the influence of the Persian Empire and Zoroastrianism. And so these ideas begin to percolate into Jewish life and create this new kinds of synthesis about how to think about the cosmos, how to think about God. There began to be created a very elaborate angelology. And again, if you look at some of the PU team, some of the poems that we read on High Holidays, you'll see some of it in there. Um, things we don't normally think about. So in this extra biblical literature, we see the concept of Mashiach, Messiah, begin to morph and change. Testament of Levi, um, somewhere in that time frame, uh, is part of something called the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs. By the way, you can get all of these books in English translation. You may not love reading them after a while. I think the worst um, scripture I've ever tried to read is Book of Mormon. These do not, these are like kind of a second place in some of them. They're full of, you know, uh, flighty language. You have to really, really like a lot of cosmic imagery. Um, but here we have the idea, oh, well, really there's two messiahs. There's going to be a priest messiah and a king messiah. And then there's going to be a prophet who is going to announce the king messiah um, all of this is going to feed right into early Christianity. Again, we don't know who believed it. We don't know who followed it. We don't have, we have very little historical information about whether there were communities who adopted these texts as their holy writ we, or whether it was just preserved somewhere and some person just wrote this. We really do not know. This, if anybody is able to dig up some of this information archeologically, they will be the heroes of biblical archeology. span Now, first Enoch, we have a better idea. First Enoch was a bestseller in extra biblical literature, found a copy of this is found in the Dead Sea Scrolls and also in the Cairo Geniza. Now the Cairo Geniza was a medieval storehouse. It stored medieval texts. Um, and this is because people didn't want to destroy texts with God's name. This was put aside to, for eventual burial. And thank goodness it wasn't buried so that archaeologists could find these and, and learn so, so much. But First Enoch was really a bestseller. And First Enoch suggests in its flighty writing 
that a messiah, literally a flight, uh, to, to the heavens. A messiah is a semi-divine being created at the very beginning of creation itself. He will supervise the final judgment and sit on a throne of glory. Okay, and where do you get this from? Well, Enoch never died. If you read in Genesis in the Bible, it said he was not, it doesn't say he died, it said he was not for God took him. And it had long been understood that that meant that he was somehow magically transported to where God was. He did not die. We also have another figure who did not die, and that's Elijah, who went into the fiery chariot after he had anointed Elisha, his successor, and he went right up into heaven. It is not surprising that Elijah is the prophet who is supposed to announce the Messiah. And it is not surprising that in other books called of Enoch, that Enoch himself is said to transform into an angel called Metatron, uh, uh, winks to anybody who is a Star Trek original series fan, and that he that he literally transformed into an angelic being who will be the Messiah. So the the and literally this is a flight of fancy in the sense that they're taking flights through the heavens and seeing all of these heavenly wonders and all of these secrets are being revealed to Enoch. Okay. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have other ideas. So the Dead Sea Scrolls, again, I don't believe this was just from one group. I think the scholarly consensus now is that this was kind of a library. And so, uh, yes, there were things belonging to the Dead Sea community, and they followed those, but also there were many, many books that they may have simply collected. So we do have uh, material that certainly in the first century, there was a belief that the Messiah would wage war on Israel's enemies, uh, that the Messiah will be there at the resurrection of the dead. And that's something we already saw in First Enoch. And finally, the Damascus document and the Messianic rule, and these were definitely documents that this Qumran community, this Dead Sea community followed. They identified two messiahs, the Messiah Ben Aaron, a priestly Messiah, and the Messiah Ben David, the kingly Messiah. And their idea was the Messiah Ben Aaron would be leading the other Messiah around, um, which again, very interesting. So this shows that this was not a concept that was completely pinned down, that this was open for interpretation and reinterpretation. Most significantly, we do get this notion that the Messiah has a lot more power than a simple mortal. We begin to infuse him with supernatural abilities and possibilities. Um, and we see that a little bit in Isaiah, that this is going to be a human being with the spirit of God in him, but still a human, to something a little more supernatural. And again, um, these are not part of our canon, our biblical canon, um, but it is interesting how the flow of thought went. Okay, connections to Christianity. Well, uh, there's an idea of Jesus as a semi-divine or full, to fully divine figure. And everyone says, oh, it came from the Greeks because the Greeks believed in dying and rising God. Yes, indeed. Indeed, they did. But isn't it also interesting that this intertestamental, this um, extra biblical literature also has this and earlier in or in tandem with the Greek thought. Descendant of David. Yeah, Jesus is supposed to be the descendant of David. Both the Gospels of Matthew and Luke have a genealogy. But here's the rub. Both say that Jesus is a descendant of David through his father, Joseph. And Joseph was not supposed to have had sex with Mary and me. Jesus, God was. So it's kind of a formal thing where Joseph is, I guess, he well, the Catholics call it uh, Jesus's foster father. He is the nominal father of Jesus, right? But he's not the real father of Jesus. So is he a descendant of David, Jesus? Well, A, how much of the genealogy is invented? And because no one knew by that point who was a descendant of David and who was not. Um, but beyond that, 
you have a little strangeness going on. So sort of. Uh, Jesus in the letters of Paul and in later um, uh, ideas of early Christian theology says that Jesus combines the role of prophet, priest, and king. Well, where did we see this? We saw a prophet, priest, and king in the Testament of the 12 Patriarchs, which we believe preceded, is probably preceded Christianity by about 100 years. We see this in the Dead Sea Scrolls. We see this um, in the book of First Enoch, which they think is you know, somewhat older. So um, yeah, the expectation that there would be a priestly Messiah is, and a prophetic figure, as well as a kingly Messiah, it's all there in the extra biblical literature. Is close to God. Well, we have that from the biblical materials and the establishment of a new spiritual era. We have that from things like Isaiah. So it's kind of a mishmash of Greek ideas, some of the uh, per, um, the um, continuing ideas from the extra biblical literature and some takeoffs from the Bible as well. Okay, but what about this suffering servant? Whoever said the Messiah was supposed to be crucified and suffering and rises again? Well, here we have the infamous Isaiah 53. And this is something if you've ever talked to a Christian missionary interested in converting Jews, they will go right there. And it is an interesting chapter, okay? And it talks about this individual who does suffer for people's uh, bad behavior and who gets sick, but who eventually will uh, be triumphant. The problem is, if you want to read Jesus into it, you can. But other sections of Isaiah right around that time also bring in the suffering servant, the other chapters. And those don't get quoted by Christian missionaries. And the reason is, is that the suffering servant seems to morph and change within Isaiah's prophecies. So does it refer to the people of Israel, which could in fact be the case? Does it refer to a single individual? And if so, who is the individual? Isaiah could be talking about himself. Could it refer to some messianic figure? Possibly, but there is no dying and resurrection in this particular section. So it is a very, very important proof text for Christianity. It is less convincing to Jews, and it was not as convincing to Jews at the time, which is why the Jewish Jesus movement quickly turned, or Paul, intelligent man, quickly turned to the Greeks, um, because they weren't buying this. This didn't make sense to them. Uh, now, we do have some later rabbinic connections to this chapter, connecting it to the Messiah, but interestingly enough, it has nothing, it was all, all of these connections that we can find come after the time of Jesus. We don't really see any literary connection before that. Um, and I'm going to just give you a couple of these verbally so you guys can hear the thoughts of the rabbis on this. Okay. So there is a Thing called the Targum Yonatan. Um, it translates um, the Hebrew into Aramaic and it connects the suffering servant to a Messiah figure. In the uh, Babylonian Talmud in Sanhedrin, it says, and this is very late, the Messiah, what is his name? The rabbis say the scholar with leprosy, as it is said, and then they quote a section from Isaiah 53, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him a leper, smitten of God and afflicted. This follows a passage where the prophet Elijah, remember he never died, came down and told the rabbi Joshua ben Levi that the Messiah bandages his leprous sores just one at a time rather than all together, just in case he's cold, okay? So boy, that's a very different image than Jesus dying on a cross, right? Uh, there's also uh, a ver another very late uh, rabbinic commentary from the fifth and sixth centuries CE and saying maybe there were two messiahs, one is gonna try 
to uh, fight Israel's wars and they're called Ben Ephraim and he's going to die. And then there's going to be one Ben David, son of David, descendant of David, who is going to succeed. Um, and that's kind of interesting because again, you're not talking about one person who dies and is resurrected. You're talking about two different messiahs as we saw in some of the extra biblical literature. Uh, so none of this is systematic. A lot of this is simply speculation, um, but we can certainly see that this is an evocative text and it can be used to read in Jesus, but Jews traditionally, and certainly even at the time of Jesus saw it very differently. Rashi, the great medieval Jewish commentator living in what is now France, um, who wrote the definitive commentary on the Talmud, uh, definitive commentaries on pretty much everything, said that uh, this was the people of Israel as a whole, not an individual. And that's pretty much been the Jewish party line since. Okay, so Rambam, our Maimonides guy, remember his 13 principles of faith? He went through, genius as he was in his spare time, went through the Talmud and came up with a list of things that the Talmud says about the Messiah. And he is, it's sort of like the Reader's Digest version of the Talmud. It's called the Mishnah Torah. And under the section called the Laws of Kings and Wars in chapter 11, he lists this out, okay? And again, this is going to sound like a very familiar list. What will a Messiah do? He will restore the kingdom of David. He will rebuild the temple. He will gather in dispersed Jews. Um, he will not revive the dead. He will not perform miracles. He will not change the universe so that the lion lies down with the lamb because Rambam is a rationalist and he can't stand people taking metaphors literally. He's like, it's just poetic. He says this, if a king will arise from the house of David who delves deeply into the study of the Torah and like David, his ancestor, observe its commandments as prescribed by the written and oral law, if he will compel all of Israel to follow the commandments and repair the breaches in its observance, and if he will fight the wars of God, we may with assurance consider him as the Messiah. If he's doing all these things, he's pretty extraordinary. So he's a good candidate. If he then succeeds in the above, rebuilds the temple on its site and gathers in the dispersed remnant of Israel, he is definitely the Messiah. So there's going to be a lot of individuals, as we'll see, who are relatively um, good messianic candidates, but certainly at least from the Talmudic literature, Jesus does not fulfill any of this stuff. Okay, so we got to look at what I've called failed messiahs. We guess we could call them messianic candidates, okay? Jesus of Nazareth. We don't know whether he himself thought of himself as a messiah. We do know there were many Messianic candidates around this time, certainly around the year 70. This was, of course, the revolts against Rome, uh, and it was really bad before that. And so you do have a lot of magicians, wonder workers, and Messianic candidates wandering about. Jesus was one of several, uh, and uh, we don't know. We honestly do not know. We know what Paul thought of him, but we, uh, who wrote all the letters and who spread the gospel, but we don't really know what Jesus thought. We have four gospels and they have very contradictory ideas or some contradictory ideas about what Jesus said, what Jesus believed, etc. Okay, now we have a whole bunch of Jews besides Jesus. We've got Dosotheos the Samaritan. All we know, and this is from Origen, who was a Christian writer, um, he said that the Samaritans had their own messianic figure. Samaritans broke off from Jews after um, the first exile. There was still a very small Samaritan community in Israel. They still sacrificed lambs on Passover. They were a very interesting group of people. But uh, at this point, they were separate. Um, and they had separate, you know, they married within their own group and they didn't consider themselves quite the same group as uh, the Jews, um, but they had their own Messiah. Uh, several false messiahs are actually mentioned in the book of Acts, which is in the New Testament, uh, written again before the end of the first century CE, and Josephus, 
Um, here's a couple, including the Egyptian, that's all it's mentioned, uh, also mentioned in Josephus, who collected a large number of followers and ascended the Mount of Olives, hoping to take over Jerusalem. Nope, did not work. Also, Theodos, Simon of Perea, and Athlongus. Okay, so we don't have a lot of info on these messiahs, but they're all around that time, right? And they crop up because of all the difficulties, the hideous difficulties uh, being occupied by Rome. Now, some of you may know about Bar Kokhba. His real name was Simon Bar Koseva, and he changed his name to Bar Kokhba, son of a star. And he came, I think he was a pretty darn good candidate. He declared himself king, ruled over an autonomous, a free kingdom in Judea for three years, right around the 130s. He was a faithful Jew. He, I mean, we have stuff that we dug up from the Bar Kokhba caves. We have to fill in or version of Tefillin. So he was observant, he fought the Romans. Unfortunately, he died. He was smashed by the Romans in 135. Uh, and of course that, that revolt against Rome from 132 to 135 pretty much finished off the land that was devastated in the first revolt in the year 70, okay? So it did not have a happy ending, but Rabbi Akiva, who was a great rabbi uh, at the time, actually promoted Bar Kokhba as the Messiah. He really believed he was the Messiah. Moses of Crete, mid fifth century. He said he would go through the sea to the promised land from Crete, the island. And he walked into the uh, sea and he drowned and his followers drowned. David Alroy is pretty famous, the 12th century. His real name was Menachem ben Solomon, and he tried to conquer the Muslim empire, and he was killed in the attempt. An unnamed messiah mentioned by Maimonides took hold in Yemen. He convinced his followers to give away their possessions, which is a thing. We're going to, anybody, that's one of the things that shows your faith. You give away your possessions because the messiah is coming imminently. Unfortunately, he was slain. Uh, Shlomo Mocha, born Diogo, Diogo Piras in Lisbon. Um, and it's kind of a sad story. He wanted to go back to Judaism, but he had delusions of grandeur, declared himself a Messiah, and he would not convert back to Christianity, so he was burned at the stake. The two most famous in European or quasi-European Jewish history, because Shabtai Tzvi actually kind of uh, spans uh, the Middle East as well. Shabtai Tzvi was the most popular messianic figure um, and uh, he ended up not really working out. A lot of people sold up all their property. Some people tried to go to the land of Israel, which was quite hazardous at the time uh, because they thought it was imminent. Um, and he had many, many believers, including the learned rabbis, some, I should say, the learned rabbis of his time. Uh, he ended up being imprisoned. He was going to fight Turkey, and he ended up being imprisoned by Turkey. And the um, head of Turkey said, well, you can convert to Islam or die, and he converted to Islam. Now, what's interesting is that Sabbateans continued on the quiet. Some of our great scholars in the next couple of centuries were Sabbateans. And they believed that uh, at some point, Shabtai Tzvi would come back or he would declare himself or reveal himself. There's even a group of Muslims called the Donmeh. Now the Donmeh follow Shabtai Tzvi because they mingle Jewish and Muslim customs or, or you know, religious traditions because they want to follow what Shabtai Tzvi did. If he converted to Islam, they converted to Islam. So this was a group of original Jews who converted to Islam, but kept some of their Jewish practices and their faith in Shabtai Tzvi. This kind of thing does not leave, okay? Um, and when you think about, let's say, Jesus of Nazareth, and you think about the great PR and the great um, reinterpretation that Paul gave, uh, that Jesus died and was resurrected, uh, and that there was going to be a second coming and all of this, you can understand why people didn't give up hope 
And they were very, very happy to hear this reconstituted version of what a messiah could be. Jacob Frank was an interesting guy because not only it was he a uh, self-declared Messiah, but his daughter declared herself the Shekhinah, the, uh, well, sort of the spirit, God's spirit, uh, who was seen as in the feminine. And she said that she was a Shekhinah. Um, very interesting. Um, both Shabtai Tzvi and Jacob Frank got involved in what cult leaders do, which is sexual misconduct. Jacob Frank was kind of notorious. Uh, and I recommend highly if you have never read biographies or any of the histories of these two, especially, uh, they're really interesting. Also, David Alroy, the ones we know about, and also Bar Kochba, very, very interesting. Okay, now this leads us up to Menachem Schneerson, and I will finish with him. Um, he's He lived from 1902 to 1994, and there's lots of messianic hopes and controversies around him. Okay, oops. So what I'm gonna do is stay, nice kind face. So what happened with Menachem Schneerson? Well, in his lifetime, people wanted to sort of make him a messianic candidate. And every time that came to his knowledge, he absolutely refused. So this is less what he wanted and more what his followers wanted. Um, so he was the seventh, Lubavitch Rebbe. He was an extraordinary individual. He was brilliant, both in Jewish studies and secular studies. Yes, he was a Rebbe, and yes, he was supposed to have like kind of some supernatural powers because of it, but we should not short this man his brilliance, because I think that's a really important part of who he was as well. Uh, Rebbe has a particular role in Hasidic Judaism. He is the conduit between heaven and earth. What his prayers are more effective. His intervention on behalf of his people is heard by God, and God also inspires him. So he's already an individual with powers above the norm. Again, not a divine individual, but somebody like we saw in Isaiah, somebody filled with the spirit of God, as it were. Um, now, we do know something about Schneerson. He um, instituted the mitzvah mobiles. He really wanted uh, to reach out to world Jewry. He believed that if enough people were doing enough mitzvot, enough of the commandments, then the Messiah would come sooner. He really had great hope the Messiah would come in his lifetime. He did not identify that Messiah with himself. But there was a problem. He was getting older. He and his wife were childless. As he became frailer, people, you know, the Chabad community was very upset. Who was going to be the next Rebbe? That was their conduit between earth and heaven. This was a special person. Could they keep going without him? Uh, and messianic expectations were totally within the group at a fever pitch in the 1970s and 1980s. And this is something that Schneerson believed in. He really believed the Messiah was going to come like the next day, okay? In the 1980s, in Chabad summer camps, children sang songs about the Messiah, okay? Now, in 1991, he comes up and he says, look, he said in a Fabrengen, in a teaching community, he said, look, I have done all I could to bring about the Messiah myself. Now I leave it up to you, my followers, to do this. Some took this as a sign that he is saying, now it's up to you to declare me Messiah. That is not what he said. Um, and this is only accentuated because there was a belief starting in the 1800s that every generation has a hidden Messiah. But it takes a special effort from that generation to have the Messiah reveal himself. So all of these beliefs kind of coalesced and his followers really were saying, is this coded language that he is going to declare himself the Messiah or does he want us to do so? So um, some people said, look, he fits a lot of the bill. No, he hasn't fought any wars per se, but he's fought wars to spread Judaism to the unbelieving world Jewry or the less believing world Jewry. And they even said that his 
home base, right? 770 uh, in Crown Heights was actually like the rebuilding of the temple. Okay, it's a stretch, but this is what people were thinking. Now, in 1991, he had a massive stroke, which left him unable to speak and unable to communicate, which is incredibly sad. He was able to kind of lift his hand. There was a few things that he could do. What is interesting is that some of his followers then connected this to, yes, Isaiah 53. And they said, oh, well, he's suffering. He's the suffering, he's suffering like the, Isaiah 53, if that means the Messiah, that the Messiah would suffer. So now there began to be a campaign to bring Mashiach now, only they're identifying it, some of his followers, as Schneerson. Uh, in 1992, there was an international campaign to bring Mashiach, founded and funded by the Crown Heights Lubavitch community. The Lubavitch are in Israel, they're in, in, in Montreal, they're in different places in the country, but the heart is in Crown Heights, arguably. And that is where a lot of this material came from. Uh, they created signs, ads, and bumper stickers that Schneerson was the Messiah. Um, when Schneerson appeared at the synagogue and he is in a wheelchair and he's not verbal, but they sang a song, Yehi Adonenu. And the translation of the, the lyrics of this is, long live our Rebbe, our master, teacher, and King Messiah. And he waved his hand while they were singing the song. Now, he liked music, he always did, but they took that as an ascent from him that they were right, that he really was the King Messiah, rather than, oh, this is a nice tune, I'm gonna wave my hand. He, because he wasn't verbal, it's very difficult to know what he understood and what he didn't understand. Um, they One group even proclaimed they were gonna have his coronation at 770, but that didn't quite happen. Uh, he died on June 6, 1994, and here is where things get really interesting, okay? Some saw this as the final thing. Okay, he died. He was unfortunately, even, you know, he really wasn't the Messiah. He never said he was the Messiah. Okay. Some, however, believed that he would be resurrected from the dead. Sound familiar? Or that he never died. And he is somewhere, I don't know, in hiding and waiting until the generation is good enough for this to happen. Hold on, folks. Make sure I'm not screwing something up here. Okay. Wow. I just got a, uh, hold on. Uh, okay. Um, I'm sorry, I got a text from somebody. I wanted to make sure it was not anyone here who couldn't hear me. When I have the full screen up, I can't really see anything else. Okay, so there was a lot of internal strife. David Berger, who was an Orthodox, modern Orthodox scholar, not Hasidic, basically called them idolaters, that they were worshiping Schneerson because, you know, if he dies, he's resurrected. He even made the claim that they were worshiping him like God, like there was no difference between the way they were seeing him and Christians see Jesus. Uh, from what other, well, I could ascertain, I do think he was a little overblown in that estimation, but there was a lot of arguing. And this was all again in the 1990s, the early 2000s. There is still a group of people who believe Schneerson is going to come back as the Messiah. I cannot say whether any of the Shalichim that we may know believe that. Um, and if they believe it, they're not going to tell us necessarily, but I'll give you two recent examples. One was in June 23rd, 2022. There was a group of signs being put up in New York City. Messiah is here. It was a lot of signs. It was put over the walk signals, I think, on the traffic lights. And it was a picture of Nearson. And it was the students who were studying at the Crown Heights Yeshiva it was spurred on by one student, Menachem Spindler, who was 21 years old. And uh, he thought that this would spur people on to greater observance and would bring Schneerson out of hiding or resurrected from the dead, take your choice. Um, he said that people, a lot of people believe it, but they just won't admit it. Uh, and Rabbi Marty Seligson was interviewed 
last, you know, last year about this. And he was a spokesperson from the Crown Heights headquarters. It sounds like some kind of spy group. Uh, and he said that there isn't a ban on these beliefs, but that students should focus on the work that Schneerson championed, not on the person of Schneerson himself, which is the weakest denial ever. It's not really a denial. And it means that people are really believing it. And I have to end with one story. I had done my research on this pretty much before uh, John and I went to a wedding of our niece and she was marrying a, uh, a, a young man who was raised Lubavitch and is now off the derech. But unusually for Hasidim, the, the kids who are off the derech and kids who are on the derech all get along. And um, when we were talking about the groom's family, the groom's mother, fervently believes that Schneerson is the Messiah, he is coming back, and that he never died. So we do have um, an ongoing belief system uh, about that. And in fact, what was really fascinating is that they read a letter from the Rebbe. And I'm like, Rebbe's been dead. What is this? You know, is this like spirit writing? Turns out that before he died, he wrote a letter, which was a lovely letter, you know, wishing the bride and groom all the best happiness and building a Jewish, Jewish family. And this letter is still read at all the Chabad weddings. And you can just imagine that it brings the Rebbe's presence into focus. And certainly for those who believe the Rebbe is still living, it's sort of like that's their connection to the Messiah. So I wanna end very quickly with this little bit, and this is from Avot de Rabbi Natan, chapter 31. And again, we are very unclear on dating. Somewhere in those three centuries, this was written. And it, it said that Rabbi Yochanan ben Zaka used to say, if you have a sapling in your hand, right? A baby tree, and they tell you the Messiah is coming, first plant the tree and then go to greet him. If it's really the Messiah, he's gonna wait. And there we are. So there they are planting trees and that seems to be perhaps the more useful thing to do. So well, thank you, thank you. That was really fascinating. We have a, a little time for questions um, and um, maybe the best way is to, um, you know, help me out here if you have a different idea. You could wave your hands wildly and we can see you but you'll have to have your camera on. Or if you want to um, talk into the chat, I can try to follow that and and um, I'm not type into the chat is what I meant. And I can ask okay. those questions of Carol. If you wave your hands, then Carol can see you and call on you also. <clears throat> I can't see everyone though. Okay, well, I can help you if I... If, yes, and There's a, a number of people who have their cameras off or have Miriam has beautiful flowers instead. So <laughs> it would have to be those with their cameras on. Uh, Lila Gottlieb, go ahead. Mine, mine is not exactly um, what the rabbi talked about, but I want to share something with the rabbi. Um, I One of the places that I loved living was Northeast Philadelphia, the far Northeast. Um, and um, I know where Temple University is, and um, I, I miss Philadelphia um, a lot. And... Um, that, you know, the Rabbi Ramorowski, Ellen Ramorowski, and um, the Shulston rabbis. I don't, I think one is gone, but um, I wonder if you, you knew these people and oh, yeah, and stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Ellen and I went to rabbinical school together, we were in the same class for a little bit, yeah. and I grew up in the north, I grew up in northeast Philly also. Okay. So, at so, some point, Lila, you and I need to have a northeast Philly convo. We, we, we do. We do. And, there is a group. Uh, there's a group called in on Facebook called Growing Up Jewish in Northeast Philadelphia. Oh my gosh. Okay, right. so find it. It's hilarious. But yeah, I have some issues with Facebook, but oh, that might be worth love, it. It might would be love worth to it. To check it out. Uh, connect. I, I have a question, and it's it seems like a very stupid question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Why does it have to be um, a in in all the, the Mashiach Ben David, why does it have to come from the line of David? Is that just because it's the line or is there? Because that's the promise. The okay. promise is that there's always going to be a Davidic leader. But that promise then, because it was in Isaiah? 
No, I mean, the prom that... promise actually, and I know I went really fast. The promise is actually in uh, Samuel, the book of Samuel. Oh, okay. And so David is given this promise. Mm -hmm. He said there will never be a time where there is not going to be a descendant of yours. Mm -hmm. who is All right. And so the expectation always was that there would be a kingship. I mean, we're coming into Hanukkah. That's what the Hasmoneans tried to do, right? And the reason that we focus on the oil, or the rabbis did, rather than the, for me, far more interesting story of the battles and mm -hmm. the Hasmoneans is that once these folks took power, they became as bad as any Greek or Hellenic king. And so, you know, you may have high hopes for the Maccabees, but they didn't really fulfill those hopes. And it kind of turned the rabbis off of Hanukkah as, you know, a military victory. So they wanted to focus on God and they didn't want to focus on the very, very disappointing uh, 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 Hasmonean rulers. In fact, there is a fairly horrific story where one of the Hasmonean rulers was, he said, well, I'm king, but I'm also high priest. Sound familiar? That mm -hmm. idea, right? And this is this is before Christianity. I'm the Messiah, so I'm you know I'm the king, so I'm also the high priest. And he um, on Sukkot he took the role of the priest, and the Pharisees, the proto rabbinic Jews, were so pissed off that they took their citrons, their et rogim, and they threw it at him. They pelted him, <laughs> and his response was to crucify Pharisees. He literally, so the crucifixion, let's be clear, crucifixion was a very common punishment back then. And the first Jews that we know were crucified uh, en masse uh, was done by Alexander Janaeus. Uh, so interesting. So you can see why the rabbinic Jews, right, um, looked at the Hasmoneans as like the big disappointment. Uh, and so that notion, the Hasmoneans were trying to sort of take the place of King David, but they couldn't. I mean, and then there was a problem with um, the descendants as well, as much as they tried to to square that. Thank you. Judy has a question. Hi, thank you for that wonderful talk. And I just want to ask a follow up question to what you just were talking about. Like, how did Hanukkah catch on then? <laughs> you know, that's a good question. Um, I think, okay, we need something light in the darkness of the, of, of the winter. We do. And every religion comes up with something, okay? Every single one. So the popularity of Hanukkah um, maintained itself simply because you needed a winter holiday of light, as far as I'm concerned. And then the rabbis came up with the idea of the miracle and medieval Jews came up with the idea of the dreidel and modern American Jews came up with the idea of chocolate gelt and we're all good. And Hanukkah, you have to remember, certainly Hanukkah would have been a heck of a lot more minor holiday had it not been for Christianity, right? Um, it was not really popularized until, um, and many Jews just celebrated Christmas as a secular holiday. And then there was a resurgence. There was a, a push by rabbis and by Jewish leaders to push Hanukkah as a central observance. So that's kind of interesting in and of itself. Um, there's some, been some articles and books written on that as well. Any, uh, any last questions? John had his hand up. Yeah, John, okay. you answer him. I could go out in the hall and answer him. Yeah, but... I could. I could save this, but no. Um, I believe that there is a um, minority opinion in the Mishnah that one who reads the Book of Manic, uh, Maccabees is barred from Olam Haba. Oops! Too late. Well, it's a minority <laughs> opinion. It didn't get the. Uh, I never heard that, but but yeah, no, I'm sunk, and I read all that to our kid, and now she's sunk. Uh oh. Uh oh. Uh oh. Well, she didn't read it. You did. So yeah. I read it to her, and she was a minor. She was not even mm. thirteen. So there we are. There we are. She's safe. Yeah. Yep. 
So what about the um, the Chabad? I mean, the Chabadniks make a lot, of, make a big deal of Hanukkah. Is that because it's popular and they're just Jews that show up? I mean, that's a piece of it. I mean, there is a rabbinic requirement to pursue Hanes, okay, to publicize the miracle, okay. So you're not supposed to just light your menorah like. I don't know, under your table. You're supposed to put it on your window. You're supposed to show it. And uh, the miracle is the oil miracle, okay? This is God caring about restoring, rebuilding the temple and restoring proper worship. Um, so it has a kind of a messianic component in a way because remember the Messiah is supposed to rebuild the third temple, et cetera, et cetera. So there's this connection of temple restoration and Hanukkah and Messiah that's one piece of it. Another piece is that, yes, it is something that Jews who don't really know a lot about Judaism like Hanukkah, and they'll come and celebrate Hanukkah. And the mission still in Chabad is to reach out to um, less observant Jews and to encourage them to be more observant. It was very interesting. There was that rally for Israel in Burlington, which John and I were privileged to attend. And this was, uh, it was quickly after October the 7th. I'm not remember the exact date, but anyway, uh, the Chabad Shalichim were there. And uh, after the rally, one of the little boys was trying to get my husband to put on tefillin. Because a mitzvah is a mitzvah. So, you know, it was, he was asking everybody, he was so cute. He was maybe like seven, eight. And, you know, but that's just part of the mission, right? So whether it's going to be Schneerson or whether it's going to be McGillicuddy, somebody else entirely, the mission is still, if we can get people to do more mitzvah, the Messiah is going to come more quickly. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, it's a much more complicated history than I thought. Well, and I, I had to simplify this down. I was so I was so savage. Um, there you can do an entire course on how Christianity developed, how it differed from Judaism. Mm -hmm. Fascinating stuff. Um, but it's also important to know that there were Jewish Christians for at least a couple hundred years uh, who kept some Jewish traditions and Jewish practices. And of course, today, and this was an area of my scholarship, um, there are Jews who believe in Jesus and who still follow uh, some Jewish traditions. There is this kind of pull because Jesus was a Jew. And so there's this kind of pull among certain Christians to sort of do what Jesus did. When I was a rabbi at a synagogue in Oregon, we always would run out of Hanukkah dreidels. The reason was, is that the Mormons bought them all. <laughs> they wanted to get close to Jesus. They had no idea this was medieval and Jesus wouldn't have known a dreidel from a hole in the wall, but they really wanted to do the Jewish thing. So it was like they'd come in and buy 150 dreidels every year. I don't know what they did with them when they were done, <laughs> but they needed new supplies every year. And I remember I did a community Seder and we had maybe 50 Jewish people and 200 really interested Christians. And that was a surprise to me. But yeah. yeah. Well, um, I know Heather had to go, um, but um, I'm just curious um, if if there's any other subjects um, that you're interested in learning about in the future um, that that um, Rabbi uh, Carol could offer or or um, that you want offered by adult ed at Hobby Zedek. It's not a trick question. It's a real question. <laughs> it's okay. It's hard to be on the spot. All right. That's fine. That's fine. You know what? I'm pretty nimble. Uh, I do have some, I'm, I'm eclectic. Um, I do, like I told you, um, Nancy, I have some things already pre-prepared. Um, and I just like weird. So you know, it's nothing, really interesting. Nothing's too crazy. And, you know, that now that this is recorded, people could go back. 
They can um, look at uh, material. And in fact, Nancy, I'm going to send you a couple of books that if people who attended or are interested, um, right. I'll send you a couple titles. Uh, but this is just the tip of a massive iceberg. Looks and like Rebecca a had a question. Yeah. Not ahead, a question. Rebecca. I just want to tell you, uh, thank, I don't want to thank you for a fascinating talk. And I'm just too tired right now to think of the question, <laughs> but I would love to hear maybe the subjects you've already prepared. I'm sure they're going to be interested, interesting. So, but thank, thank you. you. For it. Thanks, You're Rebecca. Welcome. welcome. All right. Thanks very much, guys. This was a pleasure. Oh, thank you, Carol. That was thank really you. interesting. Thank you. Much appreciated. Have a good night, everyone. I'm going to stop the recording. Thanks, Carol. Thank you. Carol. Nice seeing you, Bruce. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Red Mike. Right.